Market on China and the United States here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, this is our second panel of the morning. And this is the first one dealt with Chinese military capabilities. And this one looks at the Asian response uh, to China's uh, growing military capabilities. We have two outstanding panelists. I'm not going to run through their bios in the interest of saving time, but uh, the, the bios are in the program sheet that I think uh, most or all of you uh, have. Uh, we'll lead off with Ashley Tellis, and then we'll move to uh, Dan Blumenthal. Ashley. Thank, thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I have a very pleasurable uh, but a challenging task because I have to summarize today uh, the totality of Asian responses uh, to the developments that were described in some detail uh, in the first panel. And if I can do that, that would be some sort of a minor miracle. It would be even more miraculous because the chapters that were written uh, on Asian responses were not written by me. They were written by uh, three of my collaborators who, for various reasons, because they're not in the United States, uh, could not be with us today. So I'm going to take the best stab I can at trying to summarize how the Asian region, uh, particularly the strategic Asia quadrants, which is everything from Northeast Asia to South Asia, uh, the Indo-Pacific littorals, as it were, how the key states uh, along, this, along this belt have been responding to uh, the kinds of capability increases that were described at some length and with great clarity uh, in the first panel. The chapters that focus on this in the book constitute literally half the book. And because they deal with both extraordinary levels of detail and extraordinary uh, levels of nuance, I would strongly urge you at some point to read the chapters themselves, that whatever I do this morning uh, will be really an incomplete summary. Uh, because there are real differences of nuance given the diversity of the countries involved. Uh, there is a chapter that looks at Northeast Asia that in some detail examines Japan's response, South Korea's response, and Taiwan's response. And as you might imagine, there is considerable difference uh, for example, in the way that Japan thinks about the rise of Chinese military power, and South Korea does, with Taiwan probably somewhere in between. Uh, there is a, a, a remarkable chapter on Southeast Asia, which looks at Indonesia, Vietnam, and Australia in some detail, while also talking about some of the continental Southeast Asian states. And there is a single chapter on India, which focuses on the South Asian region, which again has a very unique perspective about China's rise. What I'm not going to do this morning, both in the interests of my own sanity, as well as the demands of brevity, uh, is to give you the details of each of these responses. Rather, what I want to do is pull together some themes that I think unify all the chapters uh, with respect to Asia. So what are these unifying themes? Let me start with the first one. None of the chapter authors has concluded that any of the Asian states that we have reviewed in this volume uh, welcomes China's increases in military capacity. I thought that was an interesting uh, insight that there are various degrees of anxiety and disquiet, sometimes even fear, but you do not find from the littoral Asian states any sense that China's increased military capacity is necessarily a good thing for them. And that, I think, is a very useful uh, backdrop to keep in mind because it speaks to some of the themes that Ash Carter flagged earlier in the morning. Uh, the persistence of historic animosities, uh, the continuation of great power rivalries in the region, and of course, the importance of the United States as somehow providing uh, a, a degree of equilibration uh, which brings order to an otherwise uh, rather anxious environment. The second uh, big point I want to make, OK, so the first point is that the region uh, exhibits a variety of responses uh, from disquiet at one end to fear at the other. Uh, very little, if any, uh, sense that China's military modernization and increases in capacity are good 
for the Asia Pacific. So that's point number one. Point number two, having said what I just said, there is still a pervasive sense throughout the region that China's economic rise is a good thing. It's of course good for China, but it's very important for the success of China's neighbors as well. And each of the neighboring states, and I use neighboring in the broadest sense of the word here, wants to maintain as strong economic ties with this rising power as is possible, even as each appears to have various degrees of anxiety about how China's growing military capabilities might <coughs> impact on the dynamic of their bilateral relationships. So in, a, in the strict sense, there is a literal schizophrenia. Uh, there is a, a degree of welcome. Uh, there is a degree of receptivity and acclaim about China's achievements. There is a degree to, uh, there is a desire to participate uh, in China's economic growth and in the benefits of China's economic growth, even as this intense desire for participation is corroded by the anxieties that appear to be in the peripheral vision of each of the actors. And the anxieties, of course, are rooted in the recognition that there are, even as we uh, continue to do the research, ongoing changes in the local balance of power, uh, changes that seem to unsettle uh, China's neighbors. This concern that the local balance of power is changing is manifested in two forms, and almost every chapter reflects this. That the balance of power is changing in symmetrical ways and in asymmetrical ways. The symmetrical forms of the changes in the balance are seen most clearly with respect to China's air and naval power projection. Uh, and because China's air and naval capabilities are changing, and because by the very nature of air and naval capabilities, they have inherent reach, even countries that are not located immediately adjacent to China see a potential challenge that must be addressed because of China, changing Chinese capabilities in, in these war fighting arenas. These capabilities in the symmetrical sense are complemented by changes that they also see taking place in the arena of asymmetric conflict. Now let me say that I don't think of symmetric and asymmetric conflict as being distinct typologies of conflict. I think of them more as being a spectrum rather than distinctive typologies, but all the same it's a useful uh, it's a useful artifact because it conveys a certain form of how power manifests itself. And on the asymmetric side, there is a great deal of concern about China's growing missile capabilities and the ability to reach at distance, the point that, uh, that Mark made uh, you know, with great clarity in the first presentation. It's also complemented by concerns about China's growing ability <laughs> Uh, to shape outcomes with respect to information, space, and electronic warfare. And again, the concerns here are because uh, China, these phenomenologies or these warfighting technologies allow China to reach at great distances from its frontier. And there are two broad consequences that follow from these changes both in the symmetric world and in the asymmetric world. And the two changes are first, there are incipient changes in the local bilateral balances of power, particularly among countries that for 30 or 40 years enjoyed advantages relative to China. So if you think of countries like uh, Japan, countries like India, countries like Australia, that until very recently were in a sense masters of their own security domains, they now begin to sense growing Chinese power as in a sense ups upsetting the world that they were very familiar with. And there is a second set of consequences that states are also beginning to be uncomfortable about. And that is China's increasing ability to impede the power of the United States, particularly in the Western Pacific and in the Indo-Pacific littorals, because of, the, uh, because of the fear that if the United States were to intervene in these areas, it would 
shape the balance to China's disadvantage. So there are two sets of fears here. There's a regional fear about the bilateral, that is, the balance is basically shifting to the, to the disadvantage of the individual countries. And then there's a fear that the great protector, the United States, whose presence in the Asia-Pacific region was, in a sense, taken for granted and unchallenged uh, for, for many, many decades, uh, now those capabilities are at risk. And so the consequences of what that means for the security of each of the individual states obviously uh, begins to be an issue. Let me end very quickly by saying something about how these nations are responding. In almost every case, if you take the descriptions in the chapters at face value, you find that the regional responses are extremely complex, uh, extremely subtle, and quite multifaceted that it does not permit what I think are straight line expectations of high intensity arms races, precisely because of the background realities of economic interdependence. And so when you look at the regional responses, even on the part of countries that are directly affected by Chinese military modernization, like the Asian great powers, Japan, India, and Australia, you begin to see a great deal of subtlety in the way they are responding. And I, I could identify four broad themes uh, that appear in each of the chapters. First, each of the countries concerned, even as, they're con even as they are worried about China's military trajectory, emphasizes deepened economic engagement. So no one wants to begin a competition with China, which in a sense uh, kills the goose that lays the golden egg. So deepened economic engagement. Second, a great emphasis on institutional enmeshment. That is making certain that China becomes party to all kinds of regional and institutional uh, arrangements in Asia in the hope that China will be enmeshed, that this will somehow limit China's proclivity to do un unhelpful things because of the equities it has invested in institutions. Third, an emphasis, even as they focus on economics and institutions, on a variety of unilateral decisions that are focused all the way from soft to the hardest forms of balancing. And this can include everything from revving up their own economic performance in order to cope with China's changes, all the way to building up their own military capacities. And each of the chapters describes this dynamic in extraordinary detail. And last, uh, and, and very interestingly, almost uniformly, a deepened reliance on the United States and great expectations that American power will continue to survive imperiled. In other words, that the United States will make all the right decisions with respect to protecting its own power political capabilities so as to aid each of the Asian regional states in the difficult circumstances that they find themselves in. And the difficult circumstances being, how do you keep the benefits of economic interdependence without being vulnerable uh, to the changes in Chinese strength. The US now becomes, in many ways, the silver bullet uh, for many of the Asian states, because to the degree that the US can play its traditional great powers pr protector role uh, without imperilment, to that degree, the tensions and the challenges facing the Asian states are mitigated. And so it's, it's a very comprehensive set of chapters that I commend to you uh, for your reading at at, at leisure. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we are now going to move from one panelist to another and from one moderator to another. Uh, I unfortunately have to live, leave to meet a, a, a Dr. Kissinger, in fact, uh, who, who's arriving at the Wilson Center, but Travis Tanner of uh, MBR is going to take over from me. Thanks. Thank um, you so much. And Dan, over to you. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Dan. Okay. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center and the National Bureau of Asian Research, as well as Ashley himself, who certainly uh, <coughs> drove this process intellectually and is an is a intellectual role model in the sense of bringing strategic studies and deep knowledge of Asia together, which I think is uh, part of what we're trying to do here. I'd also really like to thank uh, Lara Crouch, who's in the audience, who was not just a research assistant, but almost a partner in this endeavor. Uh, we think the Chinese are non-transparent about their defense uh, spending, and they are. Try looking at US defense budgets 
uh, and going through uh, the various uh, presidential statements, OMB statements, naval shipbuilding statements, and uh, uh, we may be too transparent. Uh, uh, certainly confused us, but we tried to bring some logic to it uh, in the end, as was our task. Uh, I'd like to go through five points, if I might. Uh, the first, I think, uh, has to do with, I, I'm putting my cards on the table. I'm a traditionalist in, in, in strategic matters in the sense that uh, po political goals uh, drive uh, strategy and military capabilities. So I examine, to some extent, the competing goals of uh, the United States and China in the region. Um, and the United States has, and the other way I'm a traditionalist is, uh, looking at military history and military campaigns to try to uh, give at least some baseline to think about uh, uh, the various scenarios we're talking about here, because a lot of it can uh, certainly, from as you heard from the other panel, a lot of these new capabilities can can uh, uh, again sound very um, very new, but I think some of the strategic principles remain remain the same, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But I think we have to start with the fact that. <laughs> presidents since the end of uh, World War II, or, or even as World War II were ending, ha have chosen and stuck to, in one form or another, a strategy for the United States and Asia. And that strategy has been primacy. It, it, there's other strategies available. Uh, you can uh, have an offshore strategy. You can have a selective engagement strategy. You can try to build a concert. But uh, we may say it in nicer terms, but the strategy has been primacy. And that strategy uh, has been meant to further the goals of uh, great power peace, which, by the way, has succeeded quite well over the last 30 years in Asia, I think, uh, unexpe quite unexpectedly. Second, the forward defense of, of, of the United States uh, homeland from, from any attacks uh, coming from the Pacific Ocean or Pacific approaches, uh, which is, was seared into the mind, certainly, of planners after World War II. Uh, third was uh, the trying, uh, trying to mitigate security competitions, as Ashley explained, particularly competitions in weapons of mass destruction, and I think that's been very successful. If you look at every country mentioned, uh, of the great powers mentioned in this chapter, each one of them could have but didn't uh, um, acquire nuclear weapons. Now, that might change, but that, I think, is, is, is a pretty successful nonproliferation policy. And finally, something that's been the writ, I think, of American doctrine since, uh, since we got involved in Asia, even before the 20th century, was preventing uh, the rise of a hostile hegemon who could dominate Asia and therefore uh, essentially uh, dominate uh, the world and cause problems for us. Now, the underlying military strategy for primacy was articulated best by uh, Dr. Barry Posen of MIT, who it's kind of ironic because he's very against U.S. primacy, but he articulated, I think, in a great amount of detail what exactly undergirds U.S. primacy, and that is something he calls command of the commons. And I think that's very accurate. It's not access to the commons, which is a polite way of saying things, uh, <coughs> access to domains. It's the fact that the U.S. Uh, has been able to command the commons. And I keep cyber out of here because I don't think we quite understand how you can, if you can at all, command cyber, but the, the domains of air, sea, uh, air, sea, and space. Uh, and Posen uses command of the commons. His analog is Paul Kennedy's naval mastery, but it's something even more. You can essentially get vastly more use of it than others and credibly deny it to others. And that, that makes possible all the kinds of things we've done in Asia to keep the peace or, in some cases, to engage in war. Uh, uh, over the course of, of, of 70 years. Uh, and that's what's coming under, under threat uh, more than anything else from, from China. Command of the commons means that you can, uh, as we have done in the Persian Gulf, uh, use your power against uh, a force like, uh, in the case of the Persian Gulf, Iraq, before it even can bring power to bear. Uh, so even its latent power can't necessarily be used. Command of the commons means you can project your power, as we've done, in the Asia Pacific to quiet Taiwan, crisis, Taiwan Straits crises, to, uh, to uh, prevent a coup in the Philippines, uh, to uh, deter forward in, in South Korea, uh, to engage in the tanker wars in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it means that you don't have to have all your power resident uh, 
Uh, there's a huge uh, uh, infrastructure of command that means that you can deploy forces anytime, anywhere, uh, without much, uh, without much uh, resistance. Uh, so command of the commons has been uh, key to enabling our objectives in Asia. Uh, also key, I think, to providing the extended deterrent, nuclear deterrent, because we don't, and this is often missed, we haven't had to place much of any nuclear weapons inside of Asia, they, they just, as James Schlesinger has, has said and written, uh, former, for, former Secretary of Defense, nuclear weapons are in use every day by the United States just through our patrolling and so on and so forth and our ability to do that, which uh, reassures some and of course deters others. Now China, uh, China's strategy I think has been described in some detail by the other panel, I won't get too much into that, uh, but uh, a big part of it is to rest away control at least of parts of the commons uh, and create these contested zones uh, in the near seas uh, uh, using their own precision strike complex which includes the ballistic missiles uh, more, most prominently that uh, Mark Stokes talked about but also uh, submarines and, uh, and very robust C4ISR capabilities. Uh, now contesting the zone uh, in, in closer to China's shores allows it to China to do traditional military activities. And here's where I'm a traditionalist. China writes about not only counterintervention, as Andrew Erickson said, but about regional control of the air and the seas. Uh, so uh, air control, sea control uh, in a conflict, uh, at least over the Taiwan Strait and perhaps over Japan as well. Uh, so command of the so resting control of uh, or con creating some of the contested zones uh, in inside the, the the larger umbrella of command of the commons allows you to coerce your neighbors, allows you to engage in conflict, uh, while the United States is is fighting back to to regain command of the commons and bring its full power to bear, uh, should it want to do so. Uh, I, I use an, an, a couple of analogies again. I as I said I look to military history of how China would be able to accomplish some of these goals. I look to both uh, imperial Japanese strategy, uh, which no, no analogy is perfect, obviously. China is a continental country with, with, uh, with nuclear power and a lot, of, uh, a lot of strategic depth. But in order to defeat the United States at the end of the day in a conflict, China, there are certain elements of imperial Japanese strategy that may prove attractive, or at least what the Japanese thought they wanted to do, which is strike very hard, very quickly, using surprise and deception at the frontline forces of the United States, and then create uh, layers of in-depth defense uh, afterwards, and and uh, sort of uh, uh, not taunt, but but dare the United States to enter those zones afterwards, uh, and then of course the Soviet maritime, the horizontal. Uh, escalation that the, that the Soviets were talking about, which is why this concept of anti-access and area denial is not very new. The Soviets engaged in it well, engaged, setting up maritime defense perimeters. The purpose was not to engage us in a maritime competition. The purpose was to keep us from attacking uh, content, the continental Soviet Union if they conventionally attacked the United States. The center of gravity was the, was the European continent, the maritime perimeters. Uh, were an anti-access strategy at the time so that we wouldn't be able to bring our force to bear against the Soviets. And I, again, I see some, uh, s some analogies in terms of uh, the different points, uh, the near seas, the far seas that Andrew Erickson writes so much about in, in, in Soviet maritime strategy. The third point uh, is how has U.S. responded? Well, the pivot and the rebalancing, as you heard from Ash Carter earlier, has a lot of elements to it. Uh, that some of which are diplomatic, some of which are negotiating access points and bases, some of which have trade elements to it and so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I think one thing that happened that, that at least when I was going through my research is that the, pi the pivot or the rebalance, the uh, more public comments about what air-sea battle, the air-sea battle concept means, and the defense strategic guidance all got sort of uh, shoved into one, and, and so when you're looking at, when one is looking at military manifestations of a strategic balance, you're looking at, uh, you're looking at a lot of what the air sea battle folks have, have, have said. Uh, and I, I think that, that we're, we're, and my fourth, my fourth point would be, an air sea battle has, it's an operational concept without a strategy, which maybe that's what it's supposed to be, but a lot of people are looking at it as a, as a strategy, but it doesn't answer some basic questions, such as 
uh, well, if, if, one of, uh, if, if one of the lines of attack in the air sea battle is to attack the Chinese in depth, uh, well, it's a nuclear armed country. So uh, it doesn't really answer that question. Uh, the second is, I certainly, uh, if I was a Chinese planner and, and saw the United States talking about attacking me in depth, I would start uh, looking at my nuclear policy quite a bit. And I think Mark Stokes has mentioned that. Um, as well, and it doesn't answer the question of what happens at the end. I mean, what, how do we, if we have a strategy of primacy at the end of a conflict, at the end of a competition, uh, what do we want to say to our adversaries and our, where do we want to be at the end of all that? Uh, there are, uh, so there's deficiencies in the operational concept. There's also deficiencies in strategic balancing, I think, and, and number one, the thing that stands out the most is just the numbers. The numbers just do not add up. And uh, I, I, I feel for my friends at the Department of Defense who are trying their best in this scenario to, to make it credible. But every capability that seems to be re relevant for Pacific scenarios is being cut. Uh, there was an initial cut of about $300 billion under, under Secretary Gates for efficiency purposes, or they called them efficiencies. There was this next cut, next round of cutting that uh, Ash Carter mentioned, $487 billion. This is all before sequestration. Uh, and it's starting to really hurt. Uh, the, other, the other problem or the other issue is just as, uh, and, and I take everyone at their word that they want to enact strategic rebalancing, but it's very hard to decide to pull out of a region if the region's not cooperating with you. So the Middle East doesn't seem to be cooperating. Uh, it is blowing up. Uh, we fought a war in Libya, and we, you know, we may have said we weren't so involved, but there were, uh, by my count, in an air campaign, there were 26,000 sorties against 6,000 targets, most of them done by the United States. I don't see how you're going to pull all that capability out just willy-nilly of, out of the Middle East and the Persian Gulf with Iran and Syria and so on and so forth and put all that capability into the Asia Pacific. But even if you could, uh, it still doesn't add up. And let me just go through some numbers before I get to my final point. Uh, oh, over the next five years, defense spending will actually, uh, without sequestration, and there are a lot of uncertainties, will, will decrease by an average of about 0.3%. Uh, and that particularly hits in the procurement, uh, in the procurement budget and acquisition budget. So shipbuilding is one of the least steady programs we have today. Uh, as recently as 2012, the Navy in front of the House Armed Services Committee said ideally 500 ships of all kinds would, would be what we need worldwide. They, somebody got to them and they uh, gave a hostage, uh, take a hostage response and said actually we meant 313 or we meant three, 300. Uh, but what I tried to do uh, was look at the current uh, defense program as put out in 2013, which revised the Gates numbers down from 2012 and say, where are we going to be at 2017? And if current trends continue, we're going to be at 285 ships. 285 ships. And that's, that's the lowest we've been, I think, since World War I. Uh, <laughs> the, the attack submarine program, the one program everybody, I think, agrees is one of the most important programs uh, for the United States in, in Asia is under a lot of stress. Uh, uh, Ash Carter men mentioned the Virginia class submarine that's been, the buy has been postponed. And just given the fiscal uncertainties over the last few years, I don't think anyone can feel con confident that it won't be revised downward once again. Uh, so the shipbuilding has taken a huge hit. The uh, Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35, uh, the only stealthy, besides the F-22, stealthy aircraft we have. We don't have a bomber yet. Uh, revised downward in the five-year program from 335 to 244 total. Uh, and the, it's not as if the, the Chinese are revising their numbers down. They ha have the ballistic missile force that Mark Stokes talked about, but they have somewhere between 390 and 600 uh, advanced aircraft just in the Taiwan Strait region uh, itself. They're preparing for an air fight, their they're, they're air-to-air -air fight. The bomber's not going to do it by itself. So these numbers uh, matter quite a bit. Munitions, missile defense. Uh, Admiral Willard uh, before, and, and then um, uh, Se Secretary uh, Greenard and, and, and others have, have, have been mentioning certain capabilities they want. So they've been very careful about it, of course, because it's not their role to question. Uh, 
uh, civilians, but they mention missile defense, they mention F-35, and they mention the ability of the Global Hawk and the, the BAM system that Ash Carter talked about to operate together. Global Hawk is, is going away totally in terms of new purchases. Uh, missile defense is, is taking a, a serious cut. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm going to, the long-range bomber, something we've been talking about in the defense community since 1999, uh, 10 years later, we finally have funding for it, uh, about $6 billion or so in, for uh, an airplane that's going to cost upwards of uh, yeah, 10 times that much, if not more. Uh, is, so by 2017, we'll probably have a paper study of a bomber and maybe a down-select competition. Uh, of this, of this, uh, the, so, of this component or this capability that people think is a silver bullet for for the Asia Pacific, uh, we are at the lowest level of bombers we've had at any point in the Cold War, 135. Uh, and let me just give you some some uh, idea of how we have done business in the past. In Desert Storm against Iraq, a very unf unformidable foe, unlike China. We used 115 ships of all kinds, just in Desert Storm, to clear mines, uh, to, to, uh, to carry aircraft and do sorties, uh, and, and the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> in OIF, we used four, we used four marine uh, exped expeditionary strike groups. Uh, just that's the way we do business. Uh, these are going away. Uh, the average theater campaign uh, for the United States has been about 30,000 targets. In China, it's just orders of magnitude higher, if you want to be credible. Uh, and it just, it, it just isn't adding up. Uh, so let me finish with a couple, uh, with a couple points. Uh, one, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I'd urge you, I have charts in there about uh, how the numbers are going down and how, and, and how we fought wars in the past. Uh, and, and how uh, it just doesn't seem to be credible uh, right now, just in terms of a numbers standpoint. The last point I'd like to leave you with is, is this lost art of nuclear deterrence. Uh, I don't think it's, it's really possible to talk about, or credible to talk about, conventional capabilities in the Asia Pacific anymore without talking about the conventional nuclear mix, because we are talking about competition with a nuclear power. And, uh, and when we talk about conventional strike, and they talk about conventional strike, uh, you know, somebody's eventually going to get pissed off uh, if, if, if they're hit that badly. And I think this is an area of, of deeply needed research, which is what exactly is, it's in flux, what exactly is China's uh, nuclear policy today? And given some of the things that are coming out, uh, what kind of capability do they have and what kind of capability do we need to retain escalation control? All in there. Great. Dan, thank you so much. Ashley, thank you, too, for the uh, very insightful summaries of um, both the rest of Asia and, and America's response to China's rising military strength. And uh, we have a few minutes now for some discussion. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor again to questions. Uh, we have a roaming mic if you have a question. A uh, gentleman here in the center toward the back. Thanks a lot for your comments. Uh, Mike Miller, I'm a National Defense Fellow from the Air Force. Just a question for Dan regarding uh, kind of air-sea battle here. Uh, understand your concerns with air-sea battle as it implies to um, its uh, its implementation towards mainland China. However, as was discussed previously, a lot of our strategy now is revolves around coming to the aid of a bi bilateral partner or even a multilateral partner in, in that region, where if, say, I go to the defense of one of those partners, say Australia uh, or whoever you want to call it, where you impose that tyranny of distance against China, how do you see uh, our military capabilities and response in that scenario as opposed to, you know, uh, mainland China? It, um, it, it, I'm glad you are actually calling China out, you know, because obviously this is about China. I think the tough thing for anyone to do, you have to be much more brilliant than I as a statesman, is to reassure China that it's not about them and reassure the rest of the region that it is about China. But uh, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know how that is going to be done. Um, I, look, I, 
I, I, I have good friends in the Air Force and, and, and the Navy who I commend for, for this effort. I'm not saying that it's not a, gr a great effort, it's, it's an op but it is an operational, uh, uh, it's putting the operational cart before the strategic horse. That is not the fault of people in uniform. They're in some ways, uh, uh, I'm trying to be generous here, they're, they're some ways trying to figure out an answer to a problem before others come to uh, struggle with that problem. Uh, and and air-sea battle does answer some of the China questions. Uh, certainly being able to operate in a contested zone, if not to, uh, to be able to um, rest back uh, parts, of, uh, parts of, of, of the commons. When it comes to allies, that's very interesting because I think it's now imperative, I mean, just as uh, someone who travels to the region like many other people here quite a bit, to explain to allies or have a discussion with allies about uh, what capabilities and force structures we think they should be looking at uh, as we form this, uh, uh, this kind of, these kinds of capabilities. We are going forward, obviously, with some of the air-sea battle uh, operational concepts. So I think that, that would be uh, a key ingredient in, in, in making this strategic rebalance look more sustainable and, and stick. I don't have a good sense, and of course I'm not in government, that, that key allies have a sense of how they're supposed to posture. Other questions? Admiral McVeigh. Eric McVeigh, the Institute of Foreign Policy Analysis. Dan, do you think there is a danger that the Chinese will conclude that they've achieved a capability to deter us from effective and timely intervention and therefore be emboldened to consider a military option much uh, more readily than they might otherwise? Uh, yes, I do think there is a danger, and I think. I think in particular, in particular uh, if the Chinese, uh, or let's not just pick on China, the North Koreans uh, are able to think that, that, uh, that they can use conventional or other means, as Mark Stokes has talked about in terms of a prompt global strike capability to decouple us. Uh, and you know, and this, this really, and again, strategic principles being the same, this is what NATO feared uh, when the Soviets were, were able to strike the U.S. homeland. Uh, you know, t if, if the Chinese get to the point of having a credible conventional strike capability, uh, and that's what the North Koreans are going for too, but, you know, we'll see, uh, <clears throat> then, then I think that there's a real danger that, that it becomes uh, this age-old question of, of will the United States risk its own soil to come to the defense of uh, of an ally, or even in the case of Taiwan, a non-ally, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone we're obligated to un under certain conditions under the TRA, a and and I think that uh, I, I think that given, uh, if I was Chinese, I certainly would want the capability to decouple. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mark made a strong case uh, of of the kinds of capabilities they're looking to in terms of being able to hit the homeland. Uh, Guam is certainly no longer our sanctuary, and we'll see if, if the rest of the U.S. homeland is over the next 10 years. Great. We have another question from one of our audience members in the Overflow Auditorium. Dan, we'll give you a break, and we'll direct this question to you, Ashley. Uh, this is from Rose Chen. She asks, she says, U.S. past dealings with Asia have not been successful. For example, the loss of China, the Korean War, Vietnam, just to mention a few. What have we learned, and how can we be sure that we are not making a similar mistake in our dealings with China, in our dealings with China as a potential enemy, a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, let me make two points. The United States has lost many battles during the Cold War, but it won the Cold War. Uh, it won the Cold War with two very important consequences. Microphone, please. Sorry. It won the Cold War with two very important consequences. It preserved an Asian order that was extremely hospitable to the rise of economic interdependence and the spread of prosperity. And it's the benefits of that order that the Asian states are enjoying today, which has been a singular product of the United States' ability uh, to essentially guarantee the security of a system no matter how many individual engagements it may have lost along the way. The second thing that uh, American success did was that it dampened security competition among the Asian states. 
I mean, we see the residues of that security competition to this day. Uh, quarrels that our own allies have with one another and quarrels that could actually get a lot worse if the political and military capabilities of the United States begin to diminish to the point where those order producing functions in a sense cannot be sustained. When I look at the last 70 years, I'm happy to admit that there have been plenty of reverses, not just in the battlefield, but even in the way we conducted our political engagements. But the net outcomes have been singularly positive, not simply for the region, but for the United States as well. And the challenge where it comes to China uh, really is going to be one that we will have to confront, but whose conclusion is not yet written. And what is that challenge? You have a rising power like China, which has profited essentially from being embedded in this American order, but with ha which has its own ambitions and its own interests. And to the degree that it seeks to pursue and achieve those ambitions and interests by force, I think to that degree you are going to get a collision and there will be risks to the order that Ash Carter and others are trying, to, are trying to protect. To the degree that China begins to see its own interests served, essentially by working cooperatively within the confines of an order that fundamentally serves their interests, I think we'll come out ahead. But how do we actually make this work in practice? I think that's the business of day-to-day -day diplomacy. <laughs> And that's going to be dependent on the achievements of many others in the city, uh, and not just you know theorists like ourselves. Mark, do you want to maybe pose our last question? Uh, yeah, just a, a quick one. Um, it's something that wasn't addressed by uh, in the comments by uh, Deputy Secretary um, uh, Carter, and and uh, it's rarely mentioned, but uh, t Taiwan under its existing Republic of China Constitution is an independent sovereign state. The absence of diplomatic relations doesn't detract from this objective reality. But with this, with this in mind, understanding that there are sensitivities with, uh, uh, with Beijing, um, I'm, I'm just curious, what, what potential role could Taiwan play in U.S. rebalancing in Asia? What, what, what are we missing now, and what could be done more in terms of leveraging what Taiwan has to offer in terms of the United States and its interests? This is a trap, because he knows the answers to the question. <laughs> but I'll fall into it anyway. Um, my, my own view, and this is a whole, you know, uh, I think other conversation about, about uh, building force structure and capacity in the Asia Pacific, is that uh, the states that are a bit weaker uh, than China <coughs> can pull a page out of China and develop their own anti-access and area denial capabilities. Uh, and make it woefully painful for China to project power into their uh, countries or into their maritime zones. And you can go from diesel electric submarines to mine laying to C4 ISR capabilities and counter C4 ISR capabilities. Uh, you know, and I think this is true in Taiwan, which uh, is, is quite a c capable relatively military to some of the other countries we're trying to build capacity in like the Philippines and Indonesia, but each one of them could essentially build contested zones uh, through which uh, uh, Chinese power simply can't come, or if it can, it, it would be a very bloody affair. I think that if I may just add to, uh, to what Dan just said, the United, the United States can in a sense choose to use a range of partners, both formal allies and non-formal allies, uh, to build in, in exactly that direction. But it would require us to make some strategic decisions on a range of things, all the way from, say, technology cooperation and the release of certain capabilities, all the way to intelligence sharing about what is happening, all the way to putting in place incipient patterns of cooperation. And so I think we would have to move in that direction very smartly. And if what uh, Secretary Carter <coughs> said this morning is taken at face value, the department is obviously struggling with the best way to do that. But I think it has to be a concerted effort, and it has to involve many other countries. One, ten seconds. I think, and I'll just leave everyone with this idea, and 
a, I think it, Ashley is exactly right, I think a regional uh, consortium of C4ISR is an idea whose time has come that people can buy into uh, parts of, uh, and and everyone can at least see everyone can at least see the same picture. All allies can see the same picture of what's going on in their seas and their air. Great topic for the next discussion. Thank you, thank you both. Um, appreciate it very much. And just to conclude, I'd like to uh, once again thank. Dan, Ashley, the other authors that were here with us today, those that couldn't be here as well um, for their contributions to this year's Strategic Asia volume. I'd like to thank all of the audience members here with us um, that have joined us today for the great questions that you've posed and ask you to join me in, in thanking all of the panelists and for the, the great presentations they've made. Thank you. Thank you.